Okay, so we're going to talk about the clinical importance of muscles and why uh, muscles are important to us as an RVT. So in our daily jobs, <laughs> why do we need to know about muscles? And more importantly, specific muscles and the applicable uses for each. I do have a cold, so just ignore my sniffling and don't feel too bad for me. <laughs> So there's a few different applications of musculature in the body. Um, in particular, the first topic here, intramuscular injections, is probably the most important to us as registered vet techs. Um, knowing the safe locations per species, so where we are permitted to give injections in the, into the muscle, uh, the contraindications around each specific location, and the safety around each location is extremely important to us to ensure the best treatment of our patients. We use muscles in regard to muscle, muscle condition scoring, and we'll talk about this, but it can assist in the determination of ongoing disease processes, and it really is part of our physical exam. So whether we outwardly identify a muscle condition score or we note that there are specific areas of decreased musculature, they're both important and they both need to be noted because it helps the doctor come to a full conclusion about what the heck is going on with that patient. Care of muscles and associated tendons. In particular, uh, this one is of utmost important to our importance to our equine patients, and in particular, their distal limbs. So specific care regarding their tendons and their musculature. Um, in regard to wrapping, putting on boots, uh, shipping bandages, etc. Care of muscles to assist in the healing of post-surgical or post-injury even. So we'll talk a little bit about passive range of motion and then the use of muscles to prevent permanent damage. So how we can assist in the healing process to reduce the likelihood that there'll be permanent muscular damage. Common injection or yeah, common locations for intramuscular injections. So there are a few different species or breeds that are like this. This is a double muscled cow. This one in particular, I th I think that this is a Belgian blue, but I could be totally wrong because I can't see anything about the cow except for its behind and its dangling testicles. Um, but there are a couple pictures in here I have that are genetically modified animals, so where their um, genetics have incorporated double muscling. And you'll see a picture of a greyhound with double muscling in it. It's kind of a little bit weird. <laughs> All right, so what are the common muscles and muscle groups used for canine and feline intramuscular injections? What are some considerations of which muscle group we would choose? And what are some precautions or cautions to each of those muscle groups we choose? So the first um, topic we should definitely cover is whether or not all medications we give can actually go into the muscle. And I asked this to the class, and generally people that put up their hand knew that the answer was no, and not all injections can go into the muscle. So not all medications <coughs> excuse me, are on label for intramuscular use. And there's different reasons for that, um, depending... Uh, the, so we have three typical spots that we give injections. One is under the skin of dogs and cats, one's into the muscle of dogs and cats, and one's into the vein. And those three categories of injection locations can generally be transferred to most animals, although large animals we don't often use subcutaneous. But of those three categories, uh, a couple things come into play. So the volume that you can give into a specific area changes depending on the category. So depending if it's under the skin, into the muscle, into the vein. And absorption times vary as well, which is really, really important. And sometimes certain drugs can go under the skin, they can go into the muscle, and they can go into the vein, but we want to ensure that we're um, creating a certain absorption time for that to last a certain period of time. So an example is sub-Q injections typically take anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes to be absorbed because there's not as much vasculature, so there's not as much um, constant blood flow happening between the skin that gets it to the heart, gets it into circulation as quickly. So when we're giving something under the skin, we've got between 20 to 45 minutes, and we're looking more toward the 45 minute mark for full absorption. Into the muscle, average is about 15 to 20 minutes for that drug to get absorbed once it's injected into the muscle. Again, higher level of vasculature, there's 
uh, little veins, little arteries and arterioles that are circulating that medication around into the bloodstream. And then the fastest absorption is through the vein. So when we give something intravenously, we're administering it directly into the blood flow and it's almost immediate. So that being said, we need to know if we're giving a certain drug into the vein, we need to know to be able to expect how quickly that's going to take effect. Likewise into the muscle, likewise into the skin. Certain drugs, we want to have slow absorption. So something like a vaccination, we don't want to have a massive, quick systemic circulatory <laughs> reaction. We want it to slowly get absorbed. So vaccines typically go under the skin. And then a lot of our sedations for dogs and cats go into the muscle. Because again, we want to have that 15 to 20 minute period where they're slowly going under um, sedation. So they're slowly absorbing that sedative. Likewise, with a general anesthetic, we want them, we don't want that to be a slow process. We want them to very quickly go under anesthetic, so we tend to give that into the vein. But like I said, some of these medications can go into all three routes. Some cannot. Some have very serious side effects if given into the skin and they're only supposed to go into the vein. Some medications cause sloughing of tissue. So we need to be aware of that, that whether or not they can all go under the skin or into the muscle or into the vein and what the safety is and what the expectations are. So when we're talking about common muscles and muscle groups used for canine and feline intramuscular injections, the most common that we're going to look at are the apaxial which we often call the lumbar muscles. So the apaxial is a very broad, uh, dense grouping of muscles that lines the whole ver uh, vertebral column, so lines the spine. And in particular, we choose the lumbar axis of the, the apaxial muscles because if we think about the rest of the spine, the thorax is covered with ribs, Okay, cervical, that would be very awkward. We've got some pretty major blood vessels uh, up and down the neck here. So we want to avoid cervical, avoid the thoracic. So the lumbar, we have that nice opening because, again, we don't have anything protecting the lumbar or the abdominal organs except for lumbar muscle and fat and connective tissue. So we use the epaxial muscles in the lumbar region. And our landmarking for those, as we discussed in class and in uh, lab as well, is a finger is placed on the wings of the ilium. So one finger on each of the wings of the ilium and a finger is placed on the spine. And on either side of uh, the spine, we have a nice little triangle made with our fingers whereby we can inject. So that's a nice little triangle of lumbar apaxial muscle that is... Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's our landmarking because it helps us avoid going into the wing of the ilium and avoids us going into the spine. And we're always going to direct our needle just slightly away from the spine. And you'll learn more about this as you learn how to give injections. <coughs> the other common place that we give um, intramuscular injections in dogs and cats is the semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscle groups. And they are part of the hamstring muscle group. So we've got semimembranosus, semitendinosus are a grouping of two specific muscles that sit on the caudal aspect of the femur. Uh, semitendinosus is a little bit more deeply buried, but what we end up doing is going through the semimembranosus into the semitendinosus to give our injection. Now, uh, in your before I go into the safety around those two areas, in your textbook, I have a... I disagree a little bit with the textbook. The textbook notes a whole bunch of areas that we can use in the dog and cat, and they're a little bit non-specific. So they definitely mention the quadricep area, quadricep area, sorry, which is on the cranial aspect of the femur. They mention the triceps, which is on the caudal aspect of the humerus, and I think that's all they mention. I could be wrong, but they may mention. Ah, uh, they may even mention trapezius. So that being said, we tend not to use triceps or quadriceps in most dogs and cats for routine intramuscular injections, in part because of um, access to that area. So stabilizing that area long enough to actually give an injection can be tricky, depending on the size of the animal. And then the second part is a lot of the animals are, they don't have a massive muscle grouping in that area. So to give an injection in a cat's tricep, it's quite a tiny little muscle group. Um, 
much, seemingly much smaller than the semimembranosus, semitendinosus. So they're not off limits, but I don't really want you to consider them as common. I've never seen them used as the number one go-to. So the two most common, most widely accepted in general that I've seen are the apaxial lumbar muscles and the semimembranosus, semitendinosus. Now that being said, there are some safety precautions about both of these locations. Going into the apaxial muscles, so going into any of these muscles, uh, we need to acknowledge how big the animal is, making sure that they have adequate amount of muscle to actually give an injection into. So if it's a severely emaciated cat or a tiny little kitten, we need to be very careful. We need to choose the appropriate muscle group. So if their semimembranosus, semitendinosus is almost non-existent, perhaps we'll shift more into the lumbar area. And then, of course, ensuring that we're not giving too high of a volume for that particular muscle. So again, if they have a tiny little muscle and they need a massive volume of medication, we may need to reconsider that amount of medication or that route. It, that's often we bring that back to the doctor. And for the, we need to always ensure that we're using the right size needle so that we don't want to go through the apaxial muscles into the kidney area or into the GI system. It's rare, but when we make mistakes like that, we choose wrong size equipment, we can make big mistakes like that. So some pretty big considerations are, of course, going into abdominal organs uh, with the lumbar, which again is very rare. It's a very large grouping of apaxial muscles. It's very thick. So again, just choosing the right needle, ensuring that your needle is angled slightly laterally away from the spine when we're giving the injection. And then the bigger consideration is with the semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscle groups. So I'll show you a couple pictures, or one picture at least. A lot of the videos out there are showing the needle going directly toward the sciatic nerve when they're giving us an SMST, so semimembranosus, semitendinosus injection. That is scary, and that can have consequences. So looking at this picture here, how I've done it, um, we've got the blue little shape here is the femur. It's representing the femur. No, it's not anatomically correct. We've got the yellow line right there is representing the sciatic nerve. And then we've got this nice pink oval, which represents the semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscle group. So that being said, we have to be very careful that when we're giving an injection into the SMST, I'll just use SMST as short form from here on out, that we're not actually going into the SMST caudal to cranial, because what we'll end up doing, or we have a good chance of doing, is striking the sciatic nerve with our, the end of our needle. So the sciatic nerve lives on the caudal aspect of the fever. It's aligned quite beautifully with the femur. And if we were to poke the sciatic nerve with a needle, A, you'd get a substantial amount of pain. Anytime a nerve is agitated with a needle or in general, it's an extensive amount of pain. If you've ever had a filling done by a dentist and the freezing hadn't quite taken effect, then you felt nerve pain and it feels horrible and you jump out of your chair. The other problem, the more severe, is that we could actually paralyze that leg. So if we were aggressive enough or if the needle entered deeply enough at the right spot, you could cause permanent nerve damage in the sciatic nerve and cause paralysis of that particular nerve. So we have specific, oops, hey, no, go back, specific technique um, to avoid giving an injection into the sciatic nerve and in general to avoid uh, disturbing the sciatic nerve. So now I'll move on. So these are the pictures that I found typically on the internet about giving an intramuscular injection into the SMST. So this is a uh, Wikipedia. This is a wiki how for a wiki how to give a cat injection. So they're showing the needle entering from caudal to cranial. So they're entering the needle cranially. A couple things are wrong with this. A, intramuscular injections hurt. If you guys have had your rabies injections, which I think all of you have now, you'll notice it's not a very pleasant feeling. So it's not pleasant when the needle breaks the skin, and it's not pleasant when the medication's going into your muscle. So A, safety, hello, this cat would probably turn around and nip at the owner or the tech or the vet, whoever this is. So I don't love this picture. Second of all, they're entering the needle in cranially, which I don't love because, again, you're going into the direct um, location of the sciatic nerve. 
So I don't want to scare you away from using the SMST because it's a fabulous muscle to use. I use it all the time. Um, normally the worst part about it is that cats in particular hate having their legs extended. Dogs don't seem to mind it too much. But it's a quick and easy one to use if you have the cat being carried quite easily and you want to stay away from their um, the rest of their body. Or you could have them in a towel and just pull one leg out, which is kind of nice. So the correct process, extend that hind limb. Um, and with that, you'll learn about how to secure the limb, especially on cats. Dogs, it's easier, but cats have so much darn skin back there that their little legs tend to slip back up to their abdomen. So in med class, when you're learning about injections, you'll learn all about this. And then you're going to place your thumb on the femur. You're going to shift your thumb caudally so that your thumb is now actually sitting behind the femur, so caudal to the femur. With your fingers that are under the leg, you're going to isolate the SMST muscle group. And then you'll insert your needle caudally. Okay, and I showed you an example of this in class, in lecture. So if you missed it, you're always welcome to come up to me and ask what the heck I'm talking about. But you're going to insert your needle caudally, which means you're not inserting it toward this <coughs> the sciatic nerve. <coughs> Excuse me. You're inserting it entirely away from the sciatic nerve because your thumb is covering this sciatic nerve. And then the last portion, the withdraw, if clear, inject. That's what we do every time we give any sort of injection. We always withdraw, we get negative pressure, make sure there's no blood if we don't want to be in the vein, and then inject. And you'll learn more about that in med class. So just to recap, two most common areas we want to give for dogs and cats intramuscular injections is the semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscle groups, which are part of the hamstring muscle group. Do know how to spell those, most definitely. And the apaxial lumbar muscles are quite common and quite widely used as well. All right, so considerations when deciding where to give an intramuscular injection in cattle. Lots of considerations here, and a lot of the class answered it right off the hop, which was fabulous. We need to know what they are being sold for and what they're being used for as the end goal. So is it a dairy cattle or is it a beef cattle? Or is it a pet that's never, ever, ever going to be uh, milked or um, slaughtered for human consumption? So because we have human consumption added into this picture, we have to be very careful about our intramuscular injections. So planned use, dairy versus beef, safety, so again, actual your physical safety of being around the cow, making sure that it is safe to give the injection, you've got a restrainer, you've got um, a stanchion or a chute. And then we also, um, if you're an RVT in this field, you have to know the information about FDA approved drugs. So drugs that are approved for use in food consumption animals in Canada. And it depends on the drug itself. Some of them are unsafe. You can't use them at all. Some of them are safe with a certain washout period. So that means a period of time between giving the injection and time of consumption or slaughter or milking. <coughs> and all these need to be considered before we actually give any sort of injection. So in beef, um, in horses too, but in, uh, not just beef, in cattle, we tend to use intramuscular more than we give, uh, use sub-Q. And again, sub-Q space in a cow and a horse is much more limited than it is in a dog and a cat. The most ideal for beef and dairy is the trapezius muscle. So trapezius muscle, uh, we've got the cervical trapezius. There's also the uh, thoracic trapezius but we use the cervical trapezius for intramuscular injections. Landmarking for this one, we place one hand, so our pinky finger is placed along the scapula, so the cranial aspect of the scapula. And then with our other hand, we create a triangle, and our pinky finger rests along the neutral ligament. So remember that beautiful ligament that's in the grazing animals, such as horses and cows, from the occipital bone working its way down to the scapula. So the neutral ligament and the um, cranial aspect of the scapula. And this creates a beautiful little triangle window with our fingers. Okay, and it's within this beautiful little triangle window that we'll give our injection. And that's the cervical trapezius. And I appreciate this person for letting us use their photo. I would suggest in the future moving your name 
from its current location. It just looks a bit awkward. Just going to point that out. No big deal. Okay, so trapezius, cervical trapezius is the most common, uh, widely accepted intramuscular injection place for uh, beef and dairy cattle. Now, beyond that, beef cattle, it's... If I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't be giving beef cattle injections without speaking to the doctor or the owner, um, I, I, unless you know your your specifics very very well. So those intended uses for those particular beef cattle, and the specific drugs that you're giving. You know, if you're well versed, you'll get used to the common areas that are alternatives. But typically, we try as much as possible to stick to the trapezius area. Dairy cattle, we have a couple of options as a uh, last resort or as a secondary resort. So this one, uh, again, they're explaining it in layman's terms, and then they note the actual true uh, muscle group. So second option for dairy cattle, less ideal, is the semimembranosis, semitendinosis. And it's a smaller volume that can go into that area. Repeated injections in this area may cause inflammation and pain. So in any animal that is standing all the time, we try as much as possible to avoid using their legs. Because again, if you're starting to get any inflammation from your injection in that area, it's going to drain downwards and it can cause tension on their uh, distal muscles and their tendons and, like, uh, and their tendons as well. And it can cause some swelling. So we really do try to stay away from the legs. <coughs> and then the rump, aka the gluteal muscle, in dairy cattle is the very, very, very last resort. We really try, again, to avoid using the gluteal muscle as much as possible in the dairy cattle. So the landmarking for the gluteal muscle is the wing of the ilium, which is represented by B, the sacrum, which is that beautiful uh, shield of bone, fused bone, and uh, the ischial tuberosities. Okay, so just below the rectum. So again, using those three landmarks to ensure that we're avoiding bone is key. Then we can insert the needle into the gluteal muscles as a last resort. And this is the reason why we don't use any old muscle in a beef cow or cattle in general. Because pretty much every muscle in <laughs> the beef cattle is sold. And that's what you're eating when you're eating a steak. When you're eating ground beef, you're eating cow muscle. So for giving intramuscular injections, we have to be extremely careful that we're giving them in an appropriate place that's not going to cause scar tissue or inflammation in a potential cut of meat that would be sold uh, to the market. Common injection sites for equine. So this is Stony and his beautiful musculature. This is, I think this was from uh, 2015 anatomy class. So common injection sites for equine, we can see it really well on him. So we've got our cervical trapezius right here. And again, they're landmarking slightly off. It's a little bit more cranial. So it starts at the cranial aspect of the scapula. But the cervical trapezius. So once again, you'd put your pinky fingers of one hand along the cranial aspect of the scapula, and then your pinky fingers of the other hand along the neutral ligament, and you create this little triangle window. And that's where we'll give our injections. So that's a very common area. Another is in the gluteal muscles. So back here, and again with gluteal muscles, we're using the wings of the ilium, the sacrum, and the ischial tuberosities as our landmark to create this. You get a triangle between the three, and it's a nice pad of gluteal muscles in between. <coughs> gluteal muscles, if you look at our other horses other than poor little Stony, who's had some muscle loss over the years, um, if we still have Bob when you're watching this, uh, if you look at Bob, has a beautiful set of gluteals, and they actually rise up from the wing of the ilium. So they typically have a beautiful rounding in their gluteal muscles, and that's where we're going to give our injection. The circle should be slightly further back, caudally. Okay, so then cervical trapezius, and also we can use the pectorals, so pectoralis muscles. There are three sets of pectoral pectoral muscles. We typically use the most cranial set. Things to think about when we're choosing a site is muscling. So again, looking back at Stony, he still has really good trapezius muscles in through there. His gluteal muscles are getting quite thin. So like I said, other horses have a nice rounding in their gluteal muscles. He, his are becoming quite flat and you can really see the sacrum. So he, we'd probably opt for cervical uh, trapezius with him or even his pectorals which are still fairly plump down there. So we always want to think about drainage. 
Um, horses are very susceptible to swelling in their distal limbs. And also just in general, if they get a reaction with an injection, you want to make sure that that uh, swelling, that inflammation can drain. So up near the cervical trapezius, if they get a substantial amount of swelling, we worry about what it would interfere with in regard to the vasculature <clears throat> and breathing organs throughout their neck. Gluteals, because it's buried in such a deep set of muscles, it's draining, it, it doesn't drain very well. So inflammation, uh, infection even, doesn't drain particularly well. It has to take quite a, a get through a lot of tissue in order to drain. Whereas pectorals, a lot of uh, vaccines are given in the pectoral muscles because if they do get a local inflammation, inflammatory reaction, it drains quite easily uh, thanks to gravity. The likelihood of injury and pain needs to be uh, considered as well. And of course, the likelihood of injecting into other anatomical locations. So of course, cervical trapezius, we use our landmarking techniques to ensure that we don't go into the neutral ligament, we don't go into the scapula, and we're not going into the spine as well, the cervical spine. Uh, likewise with gluteal, we want to avoid the sacrum, ischium, and wings of the ilium. Horses, we always avoid the legs, so we could use their beautiful semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscles, but we don't. We avoid their legs like crazy. A, because they're going to kick, so that's a safety issue, but mainly because if they do um, get a significant amount of swelling or pain, they need those legs. They need all four of their legs all the time. So they don't really do as well as a dog and a cat would, whereas if a dog and a cat has a sore paw, sore limb, they just limp, and then it heals itself, and they tend to be able to put the weight on all four paws. Horses don't limp. Horses become quite lame, and you can actually get a down horse uh, if you give an injection in an inappropriate area. Okay, muscle condition scoring. I won't talk too much about it because there's mixed uh, mixed thoughts on muscle condition scoring and using an actual chart. So muscle condition scoring is a little bit like body condition scoring. And it's actually used hand-in-hand -hand with body condition scoring. So it's looking at an animal and identifying if they have muscle loss or muscle wasting. Okay, so if they start to lose muscle around certain areas. And over time, I find that this is a skill that you naturally come by um, as soon as you start seeing enough older animals, so older cats, older dogs especially, older horses, you start to notice the differences, the subtle differences. So the sunken eyes, um, the sunken cheeks, their little sunken heads, and you start to notice over time that this is actually a depletion of muscle. So looking at these two cats, I want you to notice uh, one looks very old, one looks quite young. And the reason for that, well, there's a few different reasons for that. But the one I want to point out today is the difference in muscling of these two animals. So if we look at this little guy, A, he has sunken eyes. So, he, I mean, he does start to look a little bit dehydrated with that regardless. But if we pay attention to his muscling, right around his zygomatic arch, the muscling has depleted. Uh, likewise, around his sagittal crest, the muscling has depleted, and uh, dorsal to his uh, zygomatic arch on either side, the muscling has depleted as well. So above his eyes, um, top of his head, the side of his face, compared to this little round face guy over here, his muscling is quite substantially lost, it lost in his face. Likewise, we have to use this in conjunction with body condition scoring because an animal could be a 5 out of 5 on the body condition scoring, i.e. morbidly obese, but they're still losing muscle. And that might tell us more about the animal than its body condition score itself. So comparing these two, again, it's hard to tell um, without seeing the cat in person in 3D, but this guy has a fairly round face. Uh, there's no muscle depletion at the top here the dorsal aspect of his head. He's got nice round muscling as well as extensive amounts of fat around his zygomatic arches. Whereas this guy, you start to see some depletion. So you start to see more ridges of his spine. And in the hind end here, um, and his hind limbs, you can start to see the indentation of his pelvis and then sort of a depletion of muscle here. So it's really starting to thin out. And they get almost, if you're looking at them head to tail, they sort of get like a triangle appearance where they'll still have really substantial fat around their belly, but around their spine, around their scapula, the base of their skull, they tend to, and their pelvis, they tend to be thinning out. 
So that is using their muscling to help us with our physical exam and help us identify what the heck is going on with these guys. Because again, cat and a dog can be obese, but they can have lo- no muscle, low or, or no, almost no muscle. And sometimes that means specific disease processes are taking place that are depleting that muscle. So the muscle condition scoring is a finger test. So we use uh, the pad of our finger and we use key areas. So this one's on a cat. It's very similar for a dog as well, but we use the top of their head, so around their occipital bone and their sagittal crest. We use their scapula. Um, You can use along their spine as well. And then for cats, it's really great to use their ischial tuberosities as well. Dogs, we often rely on the pelvis too. And with dogs, I find, uh, we now it's anecdotal, so it's just me saying this, but I find you tend to see substantial loss in the muscling around their pelvis. I find you see that more than you would in a cat, whereas a cat, you tend to see loss of muscling around their scapula first in disease processes uh, than you would around their pelvis. So we're looking at the difference the in layers of skin, fat, muscle, and bone. So normal muscle mass, you can see the fingers pressing here, and you get a good flex of the, the fat, skin, and muscle. Mild muscle loss, it started to be depleted. Moderate muscle loss, you're starting to get a pronounced bone that's pushing up on the skin layer. And then severe muscle loss is, of course, where you, you're, you can feel the bones quite easily, and there's not a lot of muscle there to protect. So subtle differences, it's more obvious if you jump from normal to severe, but otherwise it's typically fairly subtle and it's something that we can look at during our physical exam and comment on specific areas of muscle loss. So I find that to be a valuable tool. Okay, moving on. So another reason that muscles are important to us as RVTs in our field is if we're involved in horses in general and the shipment of large animals. So care of muscles and their associated tendons, this most often comes to play when we're talking about equine. And (coughs) excuse me, if you are an equine lover or a rider or you work with equine species, you'll know that wrapping their legs is so, so important. And you'll learn how to wrap legs in one of your med classes in the upcoming years as in your program. But the reason we wrap legs in horses, it's there's there's different types of wraps and there's different types of boots and quilts that you can apply depending on the use and uh, depending on the specific need. So a couple options might be before care of the tendons and musculature before and after exercise as well as shipping. So anytime we're shipping them, we often will wrap the legs to ensure stability and prevent injury. So the horses, like I said, cows are are sensitive as well. Horses are extremely sensitive in their limbs and especially in their distal limbs. So here's a good picture that identifies the musculature of the equine distal limbs. So just proximal to the metacarpal joint, we have the radial carpal extensor muscles, the lateral ulnar muscles, common digital extensor muscles, and the lateral digital extensor muscles. So these are massive muscle groups that allow um, flexion, extension, and use of their distal limb. And as they work their way down, they turn into the associated tendons. So these tendons and the connections between the tendons and the muscles and the tendons in general are extremely sensitive to shifting and to swelling. So if we are exercising a horse quite significantly, Uh, One thing that we worry about is swelling normally after the exercise, especially if, again, if it's a really, um, if if they're exerting themselves quite heavily. So if they get any swelling, their swelling will quickly work its way down the limb and it will rest into those distal tendons. And if the tendons themselves become quite swollen with inflammation or fluid, then they can start to shift. And as soon as they start to shift, the horse can become lame. So there's a whole, again, whole slew of different types of wraps that you can perform on your horse. Main caution is to use the appropriate type of wrap for the appropriate um, activity, whether it's a shipping wrap, a polo wrap, a quilt, etc. And more importantly is to ensure that you're applying them properly. Because if a wrap or a boot or bandage is applied inappropriately to a horse's leg, then you can actually cut off circulation to those um, superficial 
digital flexor tendons and the deep digital flexor tendons. You can, you can cut off circulation to the tendons. And while you're thinking you're doing them a good thing by preventing swelling, you're actually cutting off the circulation and it will resort, uh, result in a lame horse as well. So skill, technique, and appropriate wraps all need to be in play when we're thinking about wrapping a distal limb on a horse. Um, yes, shipping, shipping bandages, just a quick note about them, are mostly for stability to ensure that the tendons don't shift and reduce the chances of injury during sh uh, shipping of horses. There is a video too, which I thought was kind of cool. You can click on the hyperlink up at the top there, and it just shows the massive amount of layers of tendons, ligaments, and muscles in the horse's distal limb, and that all those are also in our fingers and in our hands in general, but we shouldn't underestimate how important they are when an animal stands on just one finger. Right? The horse is always standing on its middle finger. So really, really important, and we really need to make sure that we're taking good care of all those um, muscles and associated tendons to ensure that that horse isn't going to become lame. They are very sensitive in their distal limbs. So again, this is a common wrap, supporting the tendons. There are specific methods to wrapping. We want to ensure that the tendons are rotated medially uh, to ensure that they don't rotate laterally and again, slip and shift positions. All right, last application, and there are tons, I'm sure there's lots more applications of musculature for us in our field, but I just thought I'd pick out four of the most common. So lastly is supporting muscle function after trauma or surgery. So this is my beautiful dog, Leia. She was the best great Pyrenees, and she had a TPLO uh, surgery. So, uh, oh, what is it? Tibial plateau luxating osteotomy, I believe. I could be totally wrong. Uh, I don't think I am, but that is the surgery itself. So that surgery she had because her cranial cruciate ligament, which is the most common crucial ligament to rupture in large breed dogs, had ruptured and uh, it needed to be fixed. So they surgically went in, changed the actual angle of her tibial plateau, inserted a plate, inserted some screws, <laughs> put her back together, and then she had the same surgery done on the opposite leg six months later. So this poor girl had a lot of work done. So our role um, is really, really important in regard to client education around this sort of care and these muscles, as well as performance of um, specific exercises to support muscle function after trauma or surgery. So there's a lot of different types, and for us as humans, it's called physiotherapy. It's the same with dogs, cats, horses, cows, etc. But a couple that we'll focus on, um, there's different types of exercises. A common one that we use for dogs and cats after surgery, injury, trauma, etc. is called passive range of motion. So PROM, passive range of motion. So passive range of motion is when we are supporting the leg, typically the leg, depending where we're talking about here. But we're supporting the leg and the weight of the leg with our hands. And we're flexing and extending and moving that leg around to its typical full range of motion. So think about yourself, your range of motion for your shoulders. If you do really big arm circles, that's a range of motion. Okay, so that's ensuring that your arms are actually, every so often, circulating through their full range of motion uh, at some point in the day if you do your arm circles. So we're doing the similar thing for dogs and cats in their limbs passively because we can't ask them to do arm circles or leg circles. So we're doing it for them. So they are passive. Uh, they relax, they lay there, and we're grasping the leg right at the joint, um, whether it's the pelvic joint or the shoulder joint, stifle joint, depending which surgery or injury they had. And we are passively... Um, ins ensuring that that leg is undergoing its full range of motion. So the purpose of this is to allow that muscle to maintain its integrity because, as you know, if you've ever worked out, if you don't use that muscle, it goes away. It becomes depleted. So we are ensuring that the muscle does not become depleted by using it passively uh, and continuing to increase its range of motion as the animal heals, without causing further injury or pain to the animal. 
because again, we could get them to get up and run, and that might also assist in the in the range of motion aspect of it. But because they're injured, because they've had a bone surgery or a trauma, that's going to cause a lot of pain, and it can cause more inflammation uh, and a longer recovery time. So we're ideally shortening the recovery time by ensuring that their muscles continue to be worked passively. And we're also preventing adhesions. So anytime we surgically incise an animal, if an animal's uh, undergone a surgery, or if there's a massive amount of trauma, there is potential for tissue to adhere to each other. So scar tissue forms and muscle layers get stuck together, fascia layers get stuck together. So we're trying to prevent adhesions as well as working that muscle, continuing its range of motion while the animal heals. Really important. And it's one thing that we're able to show owners actively how they can assist with their animal's recovery. And then we can also perform it on animals, especially if we work in a rehab type facility or a surgical facility where they often have leg injuries or uh, leg surgeries. You can use it in other areas other than the legs, but our most common are the four legs. And the goal is really just to get them back to their normal so that they're not 10 steps behind in regard to their muscle loss uh, while they were healing from their actual trauma or surgery. This was not her normal. This is Leia, <laughs> and that's my husband. And she used to go out. She was so sneaky, white dog in the snow. So she had these TPLO surgeries. So she had the one surgery done. And if I wasn't watching her at the cottage for five minutes, she would wander across the lake and just go lay down in the middle of the snow. She'd wander about a kilometer away, get tired, and lay down. Because again, <laughs> normally she'd come running right back, but her leg hurt because she was healing from this surgery. So <laughs> a couple times, Gary had to go out in the snowmobile with the little, um, whatever that is, the little caboose, and pick her up and bring her back in. And that's not a small dog. That was a 130-pound dog <laughs> sitting in that caboose. She was a treat. So those are the four applications of musculature that we uh, most often will focus on in regard to clinical practice. Please do get to know them, and I will see you in class.